Bien, merci tout le monde de rester pour m'entendre parler en bonus là. Et merci aussi à tous les autres qui ont présenté. Euh, et euh, surtout, je voulais aussi vous dire si euh, vous avez aimé le talk de Nicolas, euh, vous allez peut-être vous intéresser à ça aussi. Je vais vous, dire, je vais vous parler un peu de certains API euh, que j'ai vus en travaillant chez Stripe euh, dans le milieu de la, de la finance. Mais par contre, je vais devoir faire le talk en anglais parce que au niveau du vocabulaire technique, je pense pas que j'ai vraiment le niveau euh, en français pour euh, bien vous en parler. So if you don't mind, I'll switch to English now. Uh, raise your hand if, uh, if, if this makes sense. Let me know if I need to slow down. Raise your hand if this is too fast. All right, here we go. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I believed about APIs in general before joining Stripe. So this is an example of a request to the Stripe API. Um, and I believe that you know, basically all APIs kind of work just like this. They all follow kind of the same recipe. So the recipe goes like this. You open a connection, a TCP connection, you send down your request, uh, you wait for a response, and then you're done. You close the connection. So this pretty much describes every type of API that, that I'd worked with up to joining Stripe. So HTTP, Thrift, Memcache, essentially all works the same way. However, this is really just one way out of many that two computer systems can have a conversation. And I guess my point tonight is that Um, this isn't the necessarily the only way and the or the only right way that two computer systems can talk. And we're about to see some APIs that are actually kind of difficult to work with as developers. Um, but I also want to point out that there's actually good reasons why these APIs are the way they are. Um, so let's dive into it. Here's the first myth that I believed, which is that each API call is kind of delineated by a dedicated TCP connection. So you have at least, at, at, excuse me, at most, one API call per TCP connection. Now, here's my counterexample. It's called ISO 8583, and it's the API uh, that Stripe uses to run the vast majority of its payments volume in the United States. So um, I'll show you a little bit more about exactly how that works. Before we do that, let's just review the you know, very basic HTTP request flow. And again, we saw this in, in Nikodas' talk earlier. So here you go. You just we're going to make three requests and get three responses. And we see that the requests and responses are synchronous and they're in order, right? You send a request, you get a response. Repeat three times. So here's how this actually works in ISO 8583. You can make a bunch of requests and then maybe you get the response for the third request first and then the, request the response for request number one and the response for re request number two. So in this case, we're actually seeing our requests and responses arriving asynchronously and out of order. So this is more complicated. Um, we basically only make this work by adding a unique identifier that we use to track requests and responses. So th there's a cost of doing this. It increases the complexity of the API. And as clients, we now need to keep track of which requests we sent, and when we get responses back, we need to be able to match those responses with the original requests. Um, however, there's also a big advantage to doing this. Now, by sending requests out of order, Uh, we can achieve much better performance, especially in the face of highly variable latency. So kind of here's the formula for understanding when to use an out-of-order protocol. If you have high variable latency and you're combining that with a high cost of opening a TCP connection, then actually you're probably better off with the complexity of an out-of-order protocol. Um, and actually I'll go back here just to give a little bit more background. You can kind of imagine in the, say, the 1980s, Um, when some of the, the big payment systems that are, in st uh, that are still in use today were being built, uh, these requirements were really important. If you're a mainframe and you're processing payments for thousands or tens of thousands of merchants, and you're talking to banks all around the world, um, you're going to need these performance characteristics. And so it does make sense to actually add that complexity to your API. All right, so let's move on to myth number two. Um, this myth is that each API call consists of exactly one request and one response. It's literally a call and response. Um, now, my counterexample is something called CAFIS. So CAFIS is a brokering system for financial messages in Japan. It's this like unique thing that only exists there, um, and it behaves pretty differently from HTTP. So let's consider the example of handling a request which is timed out. You send a request, for example, to charge a credit card, and the response just never comes back. So you say, all right, that's done. I'm going to have to somehow try this again. 
So here's how we might do that in an HTTP API. And this is actually what the Stripe API does. So what we're going to do is we're going to issue a request to say charge a card, uh, I need to charge this card for 10 euros. And what we're going to do is we're going to include an item potency key um, so that when we lose the response, the response just never comes back. Um, all we have to do is now try again. So we make, an exact we make exactly the same API call with the same item potency key. And now the server knows to just send back an identical response to the response it tried to send the last time instead of retrying a new request. So um, here is the flow for CAFIS. And it's much more complicated because now you're saying, I want to charge this card. You don't get your response. And you actually have to send a special retry message. You say it's, a, it's, it's built right into the protocol. And what you're doing now is you're expecting a special retry response. So in more abstract terms, you send your charge request. You don't get your charge response. Uh, and then you send a special retry request, and you get a retry response. Um, to kind of explain this a little bit more in terms of, um, or by making an analogy to HTTP, what you're essentially saying is that you s would send an HTTP POST request, and then right after that you would wait and send some sort of a repost uh, command on the same connection. So the advantage here is that, well, I guess we've now built error handling right into this API. The downside is the state, the connection is now stateful. As a client, I have to know, all right, do I s am I in, in the original state or am I in the retry state? So for example, let's say you send a request, you don't get a response, you send a retry request, but now you get an original like normal response. That's really weird and that doesn't make sense. Now you need even more error handling to deal with that. Here's another disadvantage. Once you break the TCP connection, you can no longer retry. So with our original example in the Stripe API, you could just retry as many times as you want. But now once you've broken the TCP connection with CAFIS, you're out of luck. There's no more retries allowed. So uh, CAFIS actually has plenty of other interesting quirks. Um, I'm more than happy to uh, discuss these in more detail when I take your questions. Si vous voulez, vous pouvez poser des questions en français et je ferai de mon mieux pour euh, vous répondre en français. Est-ce qu'il y a des questions euh, Est-ce que tu aurais d'autres exemples de, justement du protocole CAFIS, des, des subtilités ou des, des, des autres choses qu'il propose euh, Oui, ben, un, un des caractéristiques intéressantes, c'est qu'en en fait, c'est euh, au lieu, de, euh, comme, en tant que client euh, de ce service, ce n'est pas euh, vous qui vous connectez au service CAFIS. En fait, vous, vous créez un serveur et vous attendez que CAFIS se connecte à vous. Ce qui est très différent. Mais en fait, c'est euh, dans la même veine que euh, cette idée d'être de, 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 euh, aussi fiable que possible. Et euh, le, ce produit CAFIS, ce service, se, se, pense, se trouve plus fiable que vous. Alors, c'est la tâche de ce service de toujours réessayer de se reconnecter à vous. D'autres questions sur ces protocoles étranges <rire> Finalement, est-ce qu'il y a un type de protocole par banque ou c'est quand même globalement unifié, sauf, que, sauf quelques cas isolés dont tu nous parles là euh, ben, on, on voit de plus en plus euh, une, standardisa une standardisation des, des API des acquéreurs, qui sont les, les banques euh, à qui on se, on se connecte pour euh, entrer dans le système financier. Alors par exemple, Stripe travaille avec un nombre d'acquéreurs et on voit de plus en plus euh, d'XML. Alors comme ça, c'est un, euh, un protocole où on envoie une requête et on reçoit une réponse, très normal. Mais il y a toujours euh, un peu ce, 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 cette qualité ancienne de protocole où euh, tout est asynchronisé. Euh, asynchroni asynchroni <rire> et euh, pardon asynchrone. asynchrone, voilà, merci. Et euh, on voit aussi de ce genre de trucs, euh, par exemple, en, on, on voit des, des, des combinaisons de protocoles. Alors, on peut envoyer euh, une, une requête euh, de ISO euh, euh, 8583, mais transportée par HTTP. Alors, on crée le message et euh, on l'envoie euh, dans, le, dans le, euh, body, le, le, le corps du, de la requête euh, POST, HTTP. Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions Toujours pas. A priori, on a perdu les deux autres organisateurs, donc je croise les doigts pour que les bières soient arrivées. Ils sont tous les deux rués dehors. 
euh, bah, je vous propose d'arrêter là pour aujourd'hui et puis euh, d'aller voir ce qui se passe dehors. <rire> Merci. Merci.